there. It's Gary Parrish. Welcome back to the CBS Sports Ion College Basketball Podcast, where we sometimes discuss camel fighting, dodo birds, and leaky black. Matt Norlander is here with me. If you're watching on YouTube, smash the like button like your Brandon Davies. You have consent. And if you haven't yet, subscribe to the CBS Sports College Basketball YouTube channel. Please also do that while you're here. Let's get into it. Today we are continuing our summer shoot around series that uh, we're going to be doing over a seven week span. We've already uh, published episodes on Arizona, Arkansas, Baylor, Connecticut, Creighton, Duke, Florida, Atlantic, Gonzaga, Houston, Kansas, and Kentucky. We're working in alphabetical order. We turn in our attention now to Marquette. The Golden Eagles were 29-7 and last season, went 17-3 and in the Big East, won the league title, won the league tournament, got a two-seed in the NCAA tournament, beat Vermont in the round of 64, then lost to Michigan State 69-60, in the round of 32, everybody except for Omax Prosper is back from that team, which is why I have Marquette ranked sixth in the top 25 and one. We'll see what Norlander thinks about that next. But first, a word from our partners. Three on three action is like overtime all the time. Don't miss three ups on CBS and streaming live on Paramount+. Plus. All right, Deadleg, Marquette mm. as a preseason top six team. Do you stand it or can you not stand it? <laughs> All right. We might have taken a turn for the worse with these. Um, Running out of words. And uh, I assure you, there are many out there. We will, we will get I through this. Not, not ones that I know. I've used will, all the words I know. We will, we will get through this. I've used every word I know. Uh, I, feel like I don't know enough. Uh, I might be able to stand this. I mean, Marquette has now reached a place where I think the fan base is 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 obviously satisfied, but they're, they're ahead of where I think they even thought they would be. I mean, year one under Shaka was the, okay, we're back kind of year. You know, we're, we're back on the right track. Year two was uh, a, 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 just an announcement to the college basketball world that, you know, seriously, Marquette is, is, a, is a national player. And year three can be the one that, cements this program back into the top 20 to 25 conversation nationally in terms of program standing. It had fallen out of that on the back years of the Wojo era, obviously. And Shaka Smart now as a head coach is, is back in a position where he, again, as, as a coach, is a national player for the foreseeable future in that landscape there. Um, I think this is happening because not just of Shaka's ability, as a coach, but obviously the fit there, we've detailed that plenty of times previously on the show and in Marquette. I mean, here's a school with a lot of resources in a league, you know, that's all this realignment stuff has been going on over the past week. Plus Um, Marquette, you know, it's not in a league that's geographically beneficial to that school. They're in the big East, but the school is located, you know, in the, in the Midwest, right, right there in in Milwaukee. Uh, But philosophically it is a perfect marriage. Marquette is in the perfect league. um, And, it is set up now so long as, you know, shock is there continues to do his roster building in a way that is working for him and is going against the grain by not using the portal. Uh, Marquette can be thriving for the years to come. And it is absolutely earned the top 10 standing that it will get across the board heading into the season. There's really no argument against that. Now as a reminder, and I'll let GP detail the roster even further here. Um, Shaka Smart for the second straight off season has not gone to the transfer portal to tweak his roster. I won't say upgrade it or whatever. He just, and he's not anti portal. I mean, Tyler Kolek, who um, will be arguably the Big East preseason player of the year. Maybe we'll see, you know, Klingon obviously will be in that conversation, but Kolek uh, had a case as the best player in the league last season. Um, he is a transfer. He did not start his career at Marquette, but uh, last off season. Now this off season, Shaka Smart just has not gone to the portal and not had to deal with any of that and instead bet on his culture, bet on his high school recruiting. And because of that, yes, they lose Omax Prosper, who was one of the two or three most dramatic risers in the pre-draft process. I mean, when, when Marquette season ended GP against Michigan State, in that moment, the idea was that Mac, Omax Prosper was going to be coming back for another season at Marquette, but uh, had done enough to help his stock. And then the pre-draft process, he just hopped on a rocket and then lo and behold, he's a first round pick, but everyone else is back. And so because of that, with every team that we're talking about in the summer shoot around series, uh, essentially everyone is looking for at least 
one transfer to step in and play a significant role. That will not be the case at Marquette, which is coming off of a 17 and three season in the big East and really three losses overall. It didn't lose in the big East tournament was, was exceptional. And looking back, they amounted to one of the biggest surprises in the country last season. They will not have the benefit of that. There will be top 10 expectations on this group. Yeah. So if you add in the big East tournament games, they went 20 and three last season against big East opponents. Um, and, and keep in mind, this is the league that produced the national champion. The mm-hmm. national champion played in the same league as Marquette, did not win the regular season title, and did not win the conference uh, tournament. There was a possibility, like you noted, in fact, a, a likelihood that they would return everybody from that team. And then Omax Prosper, um, you know, just flies up the draft boards in the pre-draft process. And it became increasingly clear um, as we approach the deadline to withdraw, that he probably wasn't going to do it. And that's frankly the difference between Marquette being, you know, a preseason top three team um, and, and the difference between Marquette being a, a preseason top 10 team. But I obviously still have a high opinion of him. I've got him six in the top 25 and one. If you're wondering how that goes uh, within the context of the Big East, I've got Marquette sixth, UConn eighth, Creighton ninth. So three top nine teams from the Big East. And then also I've got Villanova at 24 and St. John's under first-year coach Rick Patino at 26. You mentioned Tyler Kolick uh, as a probable Big East player of the year. I don't know that you can make an intelligent argument for anybody else. He is one of only two first or second team CBS Sports All-Americans who return to college. Mm-hmm. The other is obviously Zach Eady at Purdue. And so when you – I actually did this the other night – have you looked at like preseason All American teams? Because Tyler Kolick is the reason I started looking at it. I'm like, okay, mm-hmm. starting right. point guard. Edie's the starting yeah. five. How do you fill it out in between there? Oh yeah, I haven't I haven't done that yet, but we're in the process of doing our candid coaches, and so we have an Edie related question, and so other coaches have have tossed out some other players. So I have a general idea of some of the guys that are going to be populating that first or second team. It's just like last year. It's a lot of bigs. Yes, there's a ton of bigs. I mean, you start looking at the best, who are the best return, regardless of position, who are the best returning players in college basketball? It's like Ryan Kalkbrenner, big, Hunter Dickinson, big, Baycott, Armando Baycott, big, Zach Eady, big, Um, maybe Klingon, maybe Klingon, Donovan Klingon at UConn, uh, Norshad Omir at at Miami, Um, Tolu Smith at Mississippi State. Mm -hmm. Um, It's a lot of, you start looking at guards, the only sure thing, I think, is Tyler Kolick. I mean, you've got – I'm just going through rosters. Boogie Ellis at USC, mm-hmm. Wade Taylor at Texas A&M, uh, R- R.J. Davis um, at North Carolina. Um, you know, Oh, I, I don't even mention Kyle Filipowski at Duke, another big. Kyle Filipowski at Duke's another big. Yeah, in the league, maybe Justin Moore. We'll see. Yeah, yeah. It, it's just big man the, – the, 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 Conversation about the best players of the country is going to revolve around bigs yeah. uh, once again, which, uh, again, this isn't hard to figure out why. Uh, traditional bigs can be incredible college basketball players and not really desirable NBA prospects. You get a lot of them back in school, and they tend to dominate the conversations. But if you're trying to start a uh, All-American team and you need a guard, the first place you're looking, I believe, is Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and that's Tyler Cohen. Yeah, Tyler Kolick uh, was a tremendous last season, and him and Cam Jones. I mean, Cam Jones averaged 15 a game. Kolick was good for was good for 13. That's top three backcourt in the country uh, when you consider what will be expected of them and what they already achieved. I mean, Kolick's a great decision maker, and he has grown into um, like a true leader. And and even though like Kolick and Jones might not totally jump off the screen uh they will they will make this team go i mean there's you know i think the sophomore class is going to take a huge bump this season and part i based part of that opinion on what i talked about with shaka smart last season after they actually took a loss at uconn also when you look at that marquette's schedule last season uh, most of their losses were close and in overtime so that's another reason to have a lot of belief in them but um the colec jones backcourt Marquette fans are aware of this maybe some Big East fans are really aware of it but I I really think they they take a they take it to another level this season and it will be hard to improve upon the Big East record I don't know if Marquette can or will 
But there's a very good chance that even if the record in the Big East isn't matched, this team is just as good as it was last season because everyone in theory or almost everyone should get better. And then the young guys should step up in a way that is similar, not identical, but similar to the way that we saw this happen with this team uh, last season. I mean, there was the letdown in the NCAA tournament where they lost to Michigan State. And that prevented Marquette from getting back to MSG, which is where it would uh, it would have played through in the regional semis there. And then who knows? But uh, but things look good. They're currently on an, an Italian foreign tour as we record this episode. And, um, you know, that I, I, I went and checked the team site. So they're not as, as most schools are doing these days. They're not diligently giving you. Uh, stats and, and written reports the way that once happened, because frankly, even if this isn't an issue at Marquette, uh, coaches are extremely sensitive to the fact that these overseas tours can can breed little bits of, of discontent, depending on who's getting playing time. And it's, you know, call it ridiculous, but it is part of it there. But I'll call the, it ridiculous. The reports and uh, the photos and the images that are that have uh, been beamed across the Atlantic. Uh, the guys look like they're having an awesome time. These these overseas tours just look like incredible experiences all around just to be able to get to do this. Um, and yeah, Marquette's got a, uh, it's got a well-stocked roster and I would advise against underrating this team because while anything is possible and you know, it's not unthinkable that Marquette could take a step back and go from a top 10 team to us looking up in the middle of February and you know, they're just outside the top 25. That's not impossible to think. I'd be surprised by that given what shock has been able to build there. And as long as everyone stays healthy, I mean, Stevie Mitchell, I think, is going to wind up being a significant player for them this season. And Oso Igadaro is probably actually the single player that in, you know, my four or five conversations with Shock over the past year and a year plus or so, uh, he has a tendency to single single out Igadaro's uh, growth capability and just how much he means uh, as kind of a connective piece overall. Um, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what Marquette can do and what will be, and I'll get to this in just a couple of minutes, against a very, very intriguing and challenging schedule. Well, you mentioned um, you don't know if they can go 17-3 at three again in the Big East. Um, I mean, they can. Obviously, they can. I bet against it. Tough because Yeah, it's a tough ask. It's That's a hard – that's hard for anybody ever. I know. The, the <laughs> national champion didn't go 17-3 and three in the Big East. Yes. All right? Um, and if you – I was just sort of going back through Big East records – they haven't always played 20 league games, obviously, but like you, it's hard to find a three Win. loss. Yeah. 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 Three loss. big East, uh, you know, uh, a team with only three losses in the league. Um, that's a big East member. Like that's not a normal thing. So I would argue Marquette will be better this season. Although like, there's only so much better you can be. They were great mm -hmm. last year, uh, but Marquette like can be better. They finished, I believe 10th at Ken Palm and I've got them six in the, in the top 25 and one. So that that's technically better, at least according to one metric, but worse record, better team, probably a worse record. Like 17 and three is hard in the big East. I, you could, you could go, you could finish reasonably um, with a worse league record than that, still win the league and still win the national championship. So I think Marquette's got a chance to, to do all of those things. This is on paper, one of the best teams in the country. Uh, you mentioned Tyler Cole, just to put some numbers on it, 13 points, seven and a half assists. 4.1 rebounds and shot nearly 40% from threes, 39.8%. He's rock solid. I, I think an obvious preseason all American cam Jones. That's my little homie from Memphis, six foot four, third year player, 15 points last season, shot 36% from three on 7.7 .7 attempts. So he's going to let it fly from the perimeter and he knocks down a totally respectable uh, percentage of those shots. Uh, the other returning starters are, uh, Stevie Mitchell and Oso. Oso is the one that kind of gets just sort of overlooked a little bit. Uh, maybe because the, the, most of the focus is on the backcourt. But, you know, he's a 6'9", fourth-year player. Started 36 games last season. 11.6 rebounds. 66% from the field. Played more than 30 minutes per game. He's very important to what they do. And the only new starter would be David Joplin, and he's a third-year player in the program. So, you know, he played 19 minutes per game last season. Uh, he, he's a role player, but he's a a, um, a a really good one. You know, didn't start any games last season. I'm assuming he's the one who steps into that lineup uh, in the absence of Omax Prosper. But that's a – I mean, when you're looking for guys who have accomplished things at this level and guys who have you've got experience – you know, a recent episode, we're talking about Kentucky. Do they have enough experience to actually be great? Mm -hmm. uh, with Marquette, there's no question. I mean, this is a team that should be very, very good once again. Yeah, not only that, I mean, it's got uh, 
it's it's got a, a, a tangible piece of motivation. Uh, the fact that it, it won the Big East regular season and tournament. Um, and that was, I'm vamping here. This isn't in my notes. Uh, I want to say this was the first, was it the first conference tournament championship for Marquette ever? And it was the first time it had ever won a league in a conference tournament in the same season. That had never happened before. And that was, that's obviously something of a rarity in the Big East. But then to do that and then to fall short of even making the second weekend, now you've got some real motivational tactics at play there. And nationally, oh, by the way, you know, Cam Jones was top 10 in three point attempts last season. And he's about a 37% three point shooter in his first two seasons of college. As long as he can, if they're going to let him have a green light and he can be above 35% again, that's going to be huge. Uh, Oso Igadaro was seventh nationally, nationally in field goal percentage last season, hit 66% of his shots. And then you gave the, the Kolek assist per game um, at 7.5 dimes. I mean, he was third in the country, only behind Yuri Collins at St. Louis, who was an outrageous 10 dimes per. And then Marquise Noel averaged more than more than, uh, than eight per game there. Beyond the starting five that GP just laid out for you, I will, you know, the the sophomores to keep an eye on, Sean Jones, Ben Gold, Chase Ross, guys that combined to uh, average, you know, 10 points a game. I would expect them to step up and be uh, more of an impact this year. And this will be a team that I do think, I, I do wonder if, if Marquette can grow into one of the deepest teams in the country by reliably playing nine or 10 guys that are all averaging double digit minutes. We'll see if that winds up being the case. I think they've got a chance. And then, you know, Trey Norman, a guy coming in that's a top 100 level freshman. I think he'll be an impact guy as well. Um, and we'll see how much of a leash shock it gets to the newbies because you've got so much here. And really, you want to give, you know, Jones, Ross, Gold, you want to give them an opportunity to really step up. Um, I don't know. I, I think there's I think there's a ton there. And uh, when I was looking more into Marquette, because we've already done the we've done the Creighton and the UConn one, this is a this is a great three team race that uh, that appears to be set up in, in the lead up to the start of the season. GP, um, I think I like Marquette the most narrowly narrowly of those three because of the depth, because what it, what it did last season, and while Omax Prosper leaving is going to be a ding, um, I I just don't know how much that that's going to really impact the final four national championship objective here because we haven't said the words flat out, but I'm going to say it flat out. I mean, Marquette enters this season for the first time in a long time as a viable national championship contender. That's not a, that's not a common thing with this program, but it is, it is the reality heading into 23, 24 trivia time. Fire away. Let's go. You said Tyler Kolick finished third in the nation uh, in dimes per game last yeah. season. Yeah. Why are assists called dimes? Uh, because I think I have this. Okay. Uh, and for anyone that's under the age of, let's say, probably 30. I think 30, uh, about 30 might be the cutoff here. Um, once upon a time, and uh, legitimately, if you are a 15-year-old that listens to this podcast, well, if you are, <laughs> oh, boy. Um, but if you're 18, 20, 22 years old, uh, you may well, it, it is, it's, it's not outside the realm of possibility that you have walked this planet in your short life and never encountered what we refer to as a payphone. Okay. And back in the day, BITD, when you needed to use a payphone, okay, before I finish this last time, you think what year was the last time you think you used a payphone GP? What year? If you had to, if you had to put a guess on it, I have a memory of using a payphone in like a Marriott, this is the thing college coaches used to do at these grassroots events all the time. You would see all these college coaches around these pay phones at the hotel because they couldn't make they couldn't make these phone calls from their cells, from their cell phones, and they would all be on the pay phones at like the Marriott talking to grassroots. Essentially coaches. breaking the rules. Yes, of course. Of course. Yeah. Um, yeah. I I so I delivered pizzas through college and. I mean, I can't even imagine like pizza delivery guys today and gals. They have no idea. We had a paper book of maps. Like you'd look at a neighborhood on page 42. You'd flip it open. Yeah. You're like, okay. And then you would, uh, and then uh, the, uh, you get lost at some point And you know what you'd have to do? Go find a pay phone and call somebody from a pay phone to ask them, wh where do you live? I can't find your house. So that was at least in the late nineties. I would say probably early 2000s would have been yeah. the thing. I would say there was – I definitely know I used one in the year 1999. I have a specific memory of using one. I think there's a chance I used a payphone in 2000, maybe 01, maybe 01. But anyway, to answer GP's question, to use a payphone 
to make a call unless you called collect in which you would literally pick up the phone, call collect. You would call the place you're calling, but then an operator would say, are you willing to pay for this call? Because the person calling you does not have the money to, to pay for it. The person would have to accept it before you could talk. Man, we are old. You would ask, hey, you got a dime? I need a dime. So you would you would pass someone, you would hand someone, you would assist someone a yeah. dime to make a phone call. And I'm almost positive that is why assists are referred to as dimes. Look at the big brain on dead leg. I, as you said, dimes, it just sort of popped into my head. Like, why did I, I've used that term myself? I don't know why. I don't know why. I Googled it and you're exactly right. When you were trying to make a phone call, if you didn't have a dime to make the phone call, you would ask somebody for assistance. You'd say, hey, drop me a dime. Drop me a dime. Yep. I need assistance. And that's how an assistant basketball became dropping a dime. There we go. Let's go for a little regular season win total here. I got the schedule. Marquette is not messing around. I want to say this is a top two non-con sketch of any we've talked about so far. Here it is. Home to NIU, home to Ryder. Okay. Then at Illinois. Then they're in Maui. And on that note, as we record this. Oh, my this, God. No, they're not in Maui. Nobody's well, going to be in Maui. Well, we'll see. I mean, obviously, uh, it, it is it is outright devastation in Lahaina right now um, on the island of Maui. And judging purely by the video that was shared, it appears as though the at least the exterior of the Lahaina Civic Center, as of late Wednesday when I went to bed and someone who was... Um, uh, someone had taken video from a chopper overhead. And the, the devastation in that area is unreal and so terrible and many people have lost their lives and it really is one of the more sobering images we've seen of of, uh, uh, of wildfires to come out in recent history and believe me we, we've had this kind of regularly across this country in recent years but it appears as though the Lahaina Civic Center uh, was not completely torched to the ground whether or not that impacts if Maui is going to be in Maui uh, who is to say we don't know um, we are recording this on Thursday who knows if by the time you're listening on Friday, if there has been an announcement about the future of that event, I'm guessing that they will not make a determination in the next 24 to 48 hours, because frankly, there are 400 more things minimally that are more important than that before they get to the, the logistics of if they can or should be able to host that there. If not, this tournament, because of the pandemic, has been held on the mainland in both North Carolina and in Vegas in recent years. So they will obviously schedule, schedule it elsewhere if need be. Um, so our thoughts and prayers to, to everyone that has been affected and impacted by those just awful wildfires. I mean, that is just, it, 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 you just can't believe the images when you see it. I mean, that is just complete and utter destruction there. Um, Marquette is in the, in the, in the invitation. They'll play U UCLA. Then they either get Kansas or Chaminade. Then the other half of the bracket, as a reminder, Gonzaga, Purdue, Syracuse, Tennessee. They host Southern. Then they're at Wisconsin. So they've got two road games against major, major conference teams. Not a lot of power conference teams are going to do that. On the road at Illinois, at Wisconsin. Then they host Texas in the Big East Big 12. They host Notre Dame, which isn't supposed to be good this year. And then they're at St. Thomas. So as a reminder in the non-con, at Illinois, Maui, they could well get three power conference teams. At Wisconsin, host Texas versus Notre Dame. And then they've got the round robin in the big East. So last season, Marquette went 25 and six. They, they have just a schedule that is just such a beast. So with that in mind, even though they're top 10, I'm setting it at over 24.5 regular season, 24.5 wins. I'm going first this time because I have belief in this roster. And that is a daunting non-conference schedule, but I've got belief in the roster and I think they're going to be close in the Big East. I'm going to say Marquette goes 24 and seven. Yes, I will take the under, but I'll say 24 and seven with three non con losses and four losses in league play. You copying my thoughts. I came first. You copying my thoughts. I had the same thing. That yeah. sounds like three non league losses. Um, you know, one of those road games, one in Maui. Maybe Texas. Uh, it's it could be two in Maui. Two in Maui and only when they win one, they win at Wisconsin, they lose in Illinois or vice versa. You never know. That, this three seems like a safe bet without uh, without offending anyone. Yeah. And then like I've got them. Let's say let's call them Biggie's champs with four league losses. Yeah. OK. Biggie's champs, four league losses. That's seven. Thirty one minus seven puts me at twenty four. There we go. So we match twenty four, twenty four for the Golden Eagles. And, and if that were to happen. 
you could still it's conceivable you could still be looking at uh a one two seed, seed two seed one, is still possible one would still be possible i don't know if seven losses with a one seed it's been done it's not unthinkable but i wouldn't i, I mean wouldn't, what what if what if uh three of your seven losses are to fellow top two seeds yeah like if Creighton you, and yukon uh, or, or how about the Creighton? You, uh, you know, yeah, Creighton, UConn, then and then your non-league losses are Kansas, at, at Illinois, Kansas, and Purdue. Like yeah. it is, it's possible. Yeah, but they, you know, I would. How about I would this? You ready for this? Marquette against that schedule, twenty-four and seven in the regular season, then win the Big East tournament. Go twenty-seven and seven on be twenty-seven and seven on Selection Sunday. It's possible. Yes, one seed. Yeah. That if they if they're twenty-seven and seven on Selection Sunday. Prediction in August is one seed. All right, I'm holding you to it. Drop me a dime. There we go. Let's get out of here. I hate dimes. Got a whole ashtray of them. Okay. What do you ever use them for? Loose change. What do you want from me? But do you carry around loose change? Do you I, ever um, like walk up to a counter and be like, let me count my dimes? Cr- Kramer, in that episode, you don't watch Seinfeld. You have no idea what I'm talking about. Um, But... No, that is uh, my my older son uh, is collecting coins. So that that is where this this goes. Yes. I'm gonna mail you my dimes, man. You don't need to. Do that. I don't want them anymore. You don't need to send me money. I'm Please do not mail me loose change. I'm gonna mail you loose change unless you roll them up. That's the other thing. Gone the way of the dodo practice. Who used to roll? Did you roll <laughs> coins? I rolled coins occasionally, not often, but it has happened. Yes, you roll coins. Oh my gosh. Yeah. rolling coin what do you think would happen if my kids walked in the house and they saw me sitting there rolling coins <laughs> hey when my oldest son was really young we went over to somebody's house this was still in a time where folks were transitioning to like cell phones and iphones and stuff and there was a phone on the wall like in the kitchen yeah of this home and my kids were like what is-? my son was like what is that what's going on there yeah what's up yeah. with that? i've told my oldest son i was like you remember i've actually i was like hey do you remember what happened what, what used to be the case with phones he's like they were in the wall in your kitchen. I was like, that's right. <laughs> Isn't that wild? Yeah. What if every time somebody called you, you had to go to your kitchen? <laughs> what a stupid way to live. That was so stupid. Fresh of technology. I don't know what you want from me. I can't believe we had to live like that. Shouts to Devin Downey. Shouts to Chester, South Carolina. Shouts to Huck and Larnell. Thank you guys once again for watching, listening to the Ion College Basketball Podcast. If you're not subscribed, please go subscribe anywhere you subscribe to podcasts, including Apple Podcasts and Spotify. There's more of us than there are of them. That needs to be reflected in the comments. So do that. Thank you. We'll be back real soon. Next episode in the Summer Shoot Around. It's going to focus on the Miami Hurricanes. Talk to you soon. Till then, take care.